Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our orthodontics series. In this video, we're going to be talking about retention, why we need it, types of retainers, and also types of relapse. So why is retention necessary? Well, a helpful phrase to keep in mind is it's not over until it's over. In other words, teeth will generally want to return back to their original position. And two things can contribute to this. Number one, it takes a long time for the new remodeled bone to completely mature and for the soft tissue to remodel and adjust, leading to a tendency towards elastic recoil. Number two, a minute amount of mandibular growth can continue late into adult life, and that can also contribute to relapse. So let's unpack each of these concepts in a bit more detail. So in terms of elastic recoil, we need to allow time for complete reorganization of the soft tissue fibers. And significant reorganization of the periodontium and we're mostly talking about the periodontal ligament here, occurs from three to four months after the braces come off. So full-time retention is needed during this time period if we want to limit any potential relapse. Complete reorganization of the periodontium, including gingival fibers, especially the suprachrestal or transeptal fibers, occurs from anywhere from four to about 12 months after the braces come off. And so part-time retention, usually nighttime wear of your retainers, are needed during this time period if we want to, again, limit the amount of potential relapse. So suprachrestal fibrotomy is recommended for teeth that had severe rotations. And I have an asterisk here because honestly, that's not really done that frequently anymore. This is something I would remember for the board exam, but essentially this procedure involves a severing the suprachrestal gingival fibers that exert that elastic force that might want to push teeth back to their original positions, particularly if they're rotated a lot during orthodontic treatment. But this is a bit of an aggressive treatment option, and it's not done that frequently anymore. The second reason for relapse is differential jaw growth. And differential jaw growth is per particularly important in terms of late mandibular growth. So we start most comprehensive cases at around age 12 with an 18 to 30 month treatment duration. However, late AP and especially vertical growth can lead to recurrence of the original malocclusion. AP growth is uh, ending at around the mid teenage years and vertical growth can go to late teens or even early 20s. But jaw growth can play a role even later than this, and moving teeth to an unstable position outside the soft tissue equilibrium will expose them to cheek, lip, and tongue pressure, which can cause those teeth to tip and become malaligned over time. So again, late mandibular growth, if this mandible continues to grow even at a minuscule pace, downwards and forwards into 20s and maybe even your 30s, it's carrying those lower incisors forward. And so those lower incisors are pushed into this lower lip down here, so they feel additional pressure from that mentalis muscle and the other oral musculature present in the lower lip. So those teeth tend to tip lingually to escape that extra pressure. And that's why a bonded retainer in the lower incisor region is essential to prevent lower incisor crowding, especially during these later periods of growth. So what can we use exactly? Well, a Hawley retainer is a very common retainer that's used today. It consists of an acrylic uh, palatal feature, and it's the main connector piece that connects all of the other features of the, of the appliance. The nice thing with the acrylic is it can be built up as an anterior bite plate for overbite correction, kind of like we talked about before. So if you build up this anterior portion and the lower incisors are hitting into that underside of that Holly retainer, you can help to prevent 
over eruption of those lower incisors. The outer labial bow is this portion right here, and it usually runs from canine to canine and offers excellent control of incisor position and rotation. The Adam's clasps are these parts back here, and they engage the undercuts on the molars to hold the retainer in place. So you can solder this labial bow to the Adam's clasp in the back and make this one continuous wire if, for example, you want to help keep some extraction spaces closed. So there's a lot of room for customization with these Holly appliances, which is really nice. You can also add a finger spring, or multiple finger springs in this case, if you want to apply a point of contact against the two surface to get some dental tipping. Say, in this case, we're trying to fix these teeth that are in a dental anterior crossbite. Uh, we talked about that as part of a phase one treatment plan. So you could build a Holly appliance with some finger springs to help push those teeth outwards and relieve that anterior crossbite. The nice thing too with these is that the posterior teeth are free to uh, erupt and settle. That means instead of having full occlusal coverage, like with a clear plastic retainer, the occlusal surfaces of these teeth can be left free to erupt even a fraction of a millimeter into contact with the lower teeth so that they can lock together in a settled occlusion. You can also have a holly on the lower arch and sometimes called a wraparound or a clip-on retainer. You have acrylic that runs along the lingual surfaces of the teeth with a labial bow or a plastic clip-on bar that's usually reinforced with a wire that runs again from canine to canine where we usually need the most retention. So one of the most common retainers used today other than the Hollies are the clear plastic retainers that are vacuum formed over stone casts or 3D printed models. Now there's really no difference between these and the other retainers in terms of maintaining incisor alignment, but the nice thing with these is they're a bit more aesthetic if you're wearing them full time. And that's really what it comes down to when we're talking about how good a retainer is. So it's not really one better than the other, it's more so how often the patient wears them during that critical a year a time frame after the braces are off. Another thing is especially if both upper and lower arches are retained in this way, separation of the posterior teeth and occlusion might develop. And that's because you never truly allow those back teeth to touch while you're wearing these plastic retainers. You have layers of plastic between them. So you're not allowing for the same settling of the posterior occlusion. A bonded retainer is fixed in place to the backs of the teeth so that people can't see them. And they're usually recommended if you move the lower incisors forward at least two millimeters, which means they're going to be facing some extra lip pressure. So permanent retention is helpful. Or if they were sever severely rotated, this can also help them to stay where they are. If you close a large diastema or gap between the two upper centrals, having this kind of retainer in the upper arch can be helpful as well to keep that space from reopening up on you. So for the lower, it can be a flexible wire that's bonded to every tooth like we see here, or it can be a more rigid wire that's only bonded to the two canines. For the upper, for these uh, diastema closure cases, a wire from one to one is sufficient. And finally, let's talk about the types of relapse that we can expect after orthodontic treatment and what we can do during retention to combat those relapse tendencies. So the first is a relapse of a class two problem. Now during treatment, we can build this into our treatment plan and plan for some amount of overcorrection by about one to two millimeters of the occlusal relationships, especially during finishing if elastics were used. So if elastics were used and a patient was wearing rubber bands to help fix their class two dental issue, we can expect some amount of rebound after those rubber bands are taken off. And so we plan a certain amount of overcorrection so that we can allow for that rebound to happen and we can sit in a class one relationship 
when all is said and done. Now, one important thing to know about this kind of relapse is that the more severe the initial class two problem was, and the younger the patient was at debond, the more likely you're going to have this kind of relapse. And you can consider, not too many people do this, but you can consider using headgear or a binator in addition to full-time retainer wear in order to fight against that relapse tendency. Class three relapse is similar in concept, so we want to overcorrect the occlusal relationship, again, especially if rubber bands were used. Continuing mandibular growth is very likely and extremely difficult to control in these cases. Remember, a chin cup doesn't really work. So for a class three patient, their mandible is outpacing their maxilla their entire life. That's what happened to me. And so it's a very difficult malocclusion to correct, especially if it's skeletal in nature. And a surgical correction after growth has expressed itself fully may be the only true answer to addressing a class three skeletal relationship. For deep bite relapse, we want to prevent over eruption of the incisors. We want to prevent that deep bite from coming back. So one way to do that would be to use an upper Holly appliance that has an anterior bite plate built into it, like we talked about before. For the opposite problem with open bite relapse, we want to prevent intrusion of the incisors and over eruption of the upper molars. So we definitely want to be avoiding any oral habits, so thumb sucking and maybe tongue thrusting. Those things can cause relapse if they continue after treatment's uh, finished. An upper modified holly with posterior bite blocks, that's the opposite of what we just talked about. That way we can um, prevent over eruption of those molars. Also, this might be a good opportunity to use a vacuum formed retainer with thickened plastic over those posterior occlusal surfaces, which provides several millimeters of jaw separation. So the theory there is you invade the freeway space, you stretch those soft tissues and those muscles to provide a force that opposes further eruption of those back teeth. It doesn't intrude those teeth per se, but it can impede eruption and prevent relapse of that open bite. All right, so that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to all of my patrons here for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.